Hey everybody, I want to talk about writing exposition. This is something that games generally don't do very well, and the worst part is that indie devs tend to do it, tend to do it worst. They need to do it best, because they don't have the polish to hide their bad exposition, so... Let's talk a little bit about how to write exposition. Let's give you two basic lenses, two approaches. These aren't right, these aren't wrong, they're just ways to think about exposition so that when you start to get bogged down, you can sort of pair it back and get rolling again. I'm going to teach you player-centric and character-centric approaches. We're going to start with character-centric. Basically, the idea is that exposition is usually going to be coming from a character. Whether that's the character telling the player, or whether it's an audio log, or whether it's, you know, the fact that they have a stuffed animal on their bed, it's usually going to be connected to a person. And that person is the story, and whatever they're saying is coming out of their story. So when you're talking about a character-driven exposition, you're talking about exposition that a character cares about, and more importantly, exposition that a character the player cares about, cares about. Give you an example of how not to do this. I just played a game called The Turing Test. It features no Turing tests, but it does feature the exact same setup as Portal, except for really boring. You go from room to room to room doing these puzzles, and between each room, the AI chimes in with exposition. Now, if you remember from Portal, the exposition was actually the main draw of the game because the characters were so over the top and fun. But in this case, it's not the case. They've got Hal, and Hal talks in excruciating detail about sci-fi concepts, like a third-rate sci- third college professor. He is just the worst. The concepts are theoretically interesting, but he really sucks all the life out of them by going out over them in just atrocious detail in this monotonous drone, much like I do. But I'm not coming in between levels, so uh, you don't have to put up with me. <laughs> The problem here is that the devs of this game thought the exposition was the cool part. They thought, let's explain these sci-fi concepts. The players are going to love to hear us explain these sci-fi concepts. And I mean, maybe if the players have never heard of any of them, maybe they'll feel interested for the first half of every lesson. But these are things like the Turing test. Yeah, you probably know what that is. This isn't the only way to get exposition wrong, though, because I've talked at great length about another approach, which also happens a lot in sci-fi walking sims, and that is, uh, ooh, we're so mysterious. We're not going to explain anything because that makes us deep and interesting. And you're like, no, it's an AI. And like, ooh, who can tell? And the twist is, it's an AI. And you're like, ugh. And this is actually the same issue. Both of these kinds of games think that the cool stuff is the sci-fi bullshit. In one case, they try and explain it to you at great length, thinking it'll be interesting. And in the other case, they try and hold it out of your grasp so that you'll try and find it, which I think will be interesting. In both cases, they're wrong-headed because that's not the interesting part of the story. Sci-fi concepts are very interesting, but in order for them to have a place in the story, there has to be a story. And stories are about people. The people might be robots, they might be aliens, they might be ghosts, or time whispers, or even a completely non-moving entity that we just give, you know, our, our, our um, we just give thoughts to, you know, assuming what they would feel. It can be almost anything, but it's got to be something we can feel is... A person, someone who might have wants and desires and emotions and responses, so that we can get a story out of them. Let's go ahead and talk about the Turing test, the basic storyline. There are six people landing on this planet, and uh, or moon rather, and they're trying to accomplish something great. They want to find alien life, and they do. Amazing, right? However, it turns out that that alien life could be very disastrous, and they can't go home because it might destroy the ecosystem if even one of the bacteria from this world got to Earth. So they're going to be stuck on this moon in the middle of nowhere for the rest of their lives. 
Um, they're not allowed to come home. And, you know, that's kind of an interesting idea. So here they are on the moon. And then they say, no, we're going to go home anyway. And the AI steps in and says, beep, boop, I cannot let you go home. And that is the basic story that we've got going here. And that's not a bad story. There are six faces, six people with their own thoughts on the matter. They all tried to accomplish something amazing, and they, they did. They managed it, and it turned out to be a, a monkey's paw. And now they are um, stuck, quarantined on a faraway moon. What are their stories? What are they going to do? We got six different opinions on everything that could happen. That's, that's, that's really cool. That's, it could be a really great story. And yeah, there's sci-fi stuff. And since uh, that, since that sci-fi stuff matters to some of these characters, we're going to hear about it. Maybe the guy that's in charge of the AI will talk about the Turing test. Maybe the guy that's in charge of medical will talk about the bioorganism. But the sci-fi is there to drive the story, not to um, be cool on its own. That's the theory. What sort of stories could you tell here? Well, why don't I go ahead and use the stories they literally bring up in the game and then throw away. These six people are quarantined on a faraway moon, and then Earth decides to stop sending them food. This is a strange decision because you don't have to um, shake hands with someone to deliver food. We know that pretty clearly now. But, of course, you are forcing them to leave the moon. They literally can't stay on the moon or they will starve to death. And this could be really compelling, right? There are six people, and they're starving to death. And they've got an AI that wants to lock them in. Oh my gosh, are they going to get off the moon before they starve? Are they going to eat each other? What if, what if one of them dies? You know, the AI kills them, or there's just an accident. And the other five look over at the body and go, Hmm... A little bit dark, a little bit sinister, but that could be a really compelling story. How does it roll out in this game? What does this game do with that story? Well, um, they grow cabbages, and they eat those. Yeah, problem solved. Not really much pathos there. Not my, not much of a story. But there's only enough food for the six of them. There's just not enough organic matter, earth-based organic matter, for them to grow enough vegetables for more. So when one of them gets pregnant, broop, oh no, what's going to happen? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Why would she be fertile in space? Do you think you'd, you'd... Never mind. The point is, uh, she's now pregnant and she plans to keep the baby, which doesn't make logical sense, but it makes human sense. There's, you know, the humans are, are sometimes like that. But there's not room for seven people on this on this moon. There's not enough vegetation for them to all eat. So what's she going to do? Maybe she's going to like kill some of the other people and use their bodies as, as product so that she can grow more food. How many people do you think she'll kill before the others realize what's going on? What'll her husband do? That's a compelling story, right? How do they solve it in this game? What, what happens? How does it unroll? Oh, well, it turns out five minutes later, you find out that your babies, grow, babies don't grow in space. So, so there's a miscarriage immediately. Why would you set it up like that? These two are brothers. One is in command of the mission, and the other one finds out that the AI has been controlling them through the implants in their arms. And he cuts off his arm to get the implant off. Oh, wow, that's, that's really something. Like, the mission commander has the responsibility to see the mission through and to make sure everything works and, you know, keep control over the situation. And his brother has cut off his own arm and uh, has rebelled in such a way. And he's like, freedom is the only option for humanity, and I will cut off my own arm to prove it. What's he going to do? Jeez, uh, is he going to have to hunt his own brother down or while, while his brother like invades the AI's quarters and tries to rip out all the circuitry? I is he going to make a new arm out of guns? Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Uh, he's going to go back to work and, and they're going to argue a little bit and then everything goes on as usual but minus one arm.
I am really disappointed in this storytelling technique. The problem here is that these characters never want anything for more than two or three minutes. And uh, we never really get to know them in any sort of significant way. So we never really feel anything coming out of them. So when they have to tell us exposition, it can't come from their core because their core doesn't exist. They don't have a story to tell, so they can't tell it. Whenever they start talking about the things that the devs thought was interesting, it's just the people you would ignore back in college. You don't, you don't care. You don't know them, and they are going on about boring, you know, freshman grade crap. And it's just the least interesting thing around. And that's a shame, because this could have been amazing if any of those stories had been the focus. And instead, none of them were. And that's what I mean when I say that when you're doing character-driven exposition, it has to be driven by the characters. It's not, it's not just coming out of their mouths. It has to be something that matters to them. And even if it matters to them, in order to matter to the player, they also have to matter to the player. This is something that's pretty well understood, right? You have to make sure the player cares about or respects the characters in your game, and then whatever the characters care about will be things that the player cares about. So if we want to learn more about the AI, if, if it's important that we tell the player about the AI and the fact that the AI wants to pass the Turing test, then we need a character that cares about the AI and the Turing test. So we would introduce like Doug, Doug. And Doug's like, if you bring that soda in here one more time, Sue, I am going to clock you. You know how much trouble I had cleaning up that soda out of the circuits when you spilled it last week? And now we know Doug and we know, who did I say, Sarah? We know two characters, just a little bit better. And then we have to develop them a little bit more and then a little bit more. And then maybe their fifth or sixth time we hear, he'll be like, yeah, the AI has been repeatedly requesting that I interview it. And I'm not really sure what's going on with that. And now we care because there's a character that we care about that cares about this. But that only works if the characters have a presence a story, a part to play in the narrative. And the characters in this game didn't. That's a basic idea on, uh, on the character-centric approach. You develop the characters, and if you have something that you want the player to know about, exposition that you need them to know about, make sure that it's part of how the characters are progressing, how the character's story is moving. And if you can't fit it in, then it's not part of your story. Just let it be cool in the background and don't worry about it too much. The other kind of approach is the player-centric approach. If we think about how the player interacts with exposition, there's only really three basic ways they can do it. The first is they can fail to interact with it at all. We'll call this forced exposition. For example, if you do a puzzle room and you come out of the puzzle room and you're about to enter the next puzzle room and the AI just pops in to talk at you, that's forced. The player didn't do anything that said that they wanted to talk to an AI. They weren't expecting the AI. They don't care about the AI. They're uh, they're kind of playing the game. They want to go on and do the next puzzle. They're they're in it, man. You, you told them to do the puzzles. They're wanting to do the puzzles. They're, why are you distracting them with AI stuff? A forced piece of exposition is really delicate because the player is not paying attention and they don't care. Basically, the only two things you can do with forced exposition like this is to tell the player something absolutely critical right now, like the next room is full of bees, or give them a character beat. Now, we can talk about that a little bit more in detail in a minute here, but basically, if you look at the difference between the Turing test and Portal, you can sort of see where I'm coming from, because Portal, the AI, is just talking up a storm about random bullshit, and the point is to be funny. There is exposition in there, there is character development in there, but the focus is on entertaining the player and making sure that the repetitious puzzles don't get too repetitious. On the other end of the spectrum is the unforced stuff. Unforced is just when the player volunteers to, uh, to listen to your, to your exposition. For example, you walk into a town, there's a bunch of AI, uh, a bunch of NPCs hanging around. Who do you talk to? 
Well, you don't have to talk to anybody, but the people you do talk to, that's, uh, that's unforced exposition. So you know that the player is going to be in the mood to hear about whatever it is you're trying to talk about because you have made it so the player has to ask for it. If they walk down Main Street and they see a child playing and they go up and talk to the child, they have volunteered to listen to a cheerful kid talk about how nice it is out today or whatever else that kid is likely to talk about. They didn't sign up for, you know, a dragon to sweep down and eat the kid because they tried to talk to him. That would be forced. But the fact that, it, you know, if the exposition is about what they expect it to be about, you know, if it's on the same basic plane as what they're expecting, that's unforced. They went to look for exposition of a certain type and they got it. Another example would be if you go into the barracks and everybody's got their own little bunks, right? And so you can look at their various um, personal effects and see who they are and what sort of people they were. That's another unforced setup. You go into the barracks to learn about the characters and you find out about the characters. Congrats. These unforced setups are nice, but they do have the problem where you can't guarantee the player will ever actually partake. Because they're unforced, the player might walk on past. So what do we have between the two? Um, we can go ahead and call it half forced, like a Mario button press. A half forced setup is is the but the mouse but thou must set up. There's there's a way to go forward into the next room through a door, but first you've got to talk to someone. You've got to click a button and talk to someone or whatever. You can't progress until you trigger the exposition, but you trigger the exposition. This is something that GTA really did a lot. So back near the beginning, missions would just start. They found that players didn't like that too much. It felt forced. So then there were little green circles, and you stepped inside, and then the mission started. But that still felt a little bit too forced. So now you step inside the circle and press a button, and the mission starts. The more agency the player feels, the more they're willing to listen to whatever you're going to talk about. They still expect it to be vaguely relevant to the situation on hand, but the point here is that because they have said, yeah, you can tell me, you can tell them. Sure, they didn't actually have a choice, but they are still the ones that signed up and clicked the button. So it's much more effective. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's always better than forced. There are plenty of times when forced is better, especially if you want to take away some agency from the player, make them feel like they're not in control all the time. But the basic idea here is that half forced has uh, a lot of the, the good parts of an unforced setup, but the player can't skip it. Now, these three basic ways of interacting with, with exposition uh, are ways that you start the interaction. We're not talking about how the exposition unrolls after the fact. This doesn't talk about whether or not it's, you know, a dialogue tree or a cutscene or a book that gets added to your codex. And because of that, this has a very wide range of possible setups. For example, here over here in Unforced, We've got a lot of different variations on what sort of unforced um, information setups we'd like. If the player is walking down the hall and there's a giant screen over here flashing red and green with letters on it, the player's probably going to notice. It's technically unforced. It's, it's kind of off to the side, but it's right in front of their face. They're going to notice it. Very few players are going to walk past without stopping and looking. On the other hand, you could also just hand out books or codex entries and the player is almost never going to actually stop and read those. Very few players. So you can see how we've got huge different ends of the spectrum here. Uh, and, and we can kind of adjust what we need based on how important it is for the player to find this stuff out. Uh, what sort of different players are likely to go for which sorts of different things. That sort of detail work. Over here on the forced side, we can go with like a super high pressure force. What's a super high pressure one? Well, let's say it is a room where you go in and the room is full of literal signs literally talking about the plot of the game and shouting it at you. And you might be thinking, that sounds really stupid. It's actually pretty common. Uh, for example, if you're playing a shmup and the boss is coming and the screen flashes, meep, 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 boss approaching, that's a high pressure forced exposition moment. It works fine because it's about something that you really need to know about right now and it builds that tension. We can use the forced pressure moment to take agency away from the player and make them feel worried. 
And that's what that's really good for. A way to not do that would be in the Turing test where you have large portions where multiple rooms will just be filled with monitors that tell you you're a slave and a drone. And it's not really interesting or relevant. Now, probably the reason why that feels so flat is because it's kind of unearned. There's no character there. If we're talking about character-driven exposition, then we need to have some characters involved, and writing on the wall has no character. But there are plenty of times when writing on the wall works fine. Um, so what makes this one fail? Well, because it's about stuff, not about a thing, not about a person, not about something that will affect you. So an example of a really good high-pressure character-driven beat would be in System Shock 2, where you're going up to meet up with your friend, and uh, turns out they've been dead for quite a while, and the person you thought you had been working with, the walls fall away, and Shodan comes up on all of the holographic screens all around you. And holy shit, that is like a gut punch of a high pressure forced exposition moment that is like that that is like the the high water mark if you if you want to do if you want to do forced high pressure stuff that is what you should study because there has to be this lead up there has to be this preparation the whole point here is that in order to be high pressure it has to be important and if it's not important then you need to make it important before you get there and that's exactly what they do but you can see that this sort of setup allows you to think about how much the player is going to be willing to listen to you. And when Shodan comes out up on those walls, it starts with like a, a wah ha you're so stupid, I have built up your trust. And it's really cool. And then it immediately starts to talk at great length about the plot. It goes into this massive exposition dump. But it works because it's so incredibly high impact that you've ripped the player out from wherever they were doing, whatever they were thinking about. You've ground them into this really important plot point. And you said, you, ju you just said, hey boy, you better listen to this and you better care about this because everybody you thought was alive is dead and everybody you thought was dead is alive. And yeah, that, that works. <laughs> there are plenty of other ways to do all of these. This is just an example. But when you think in terms of whether the player has bought into this, whether the player is ready for this, whether they're expecting something on this topic, then you can sort of see how you have to build the levels and the characters to make sure that the player is guided into wanting the next piece of exposition. I don't know how clear this has been, but I'm hoping it has been helpful. I'm hoping that this has, uh, you know, been fun to listen to, feel free to uh, give your own comments below and, uh, you know, get writing. Just uh, make sure not to bore the player too much. Have a good one.